Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Alara Knai. Uh, so she studied uh, cryptography with uh, mentor Janberg Irmazı. Uh, she is from Boğaziçi University. And today she will talk about understanding cryptography. Uh, so first of all, um, hi everyone, and thank you for coming today, for listening to me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about cryptography, as you can understand from my title. Um, we decided to put an asterisk on top of my title, Understanding Cryptography, because it was also the book we have studied uh, during our studies. It was a book written by Christoph Parr, who is a very famous cryptographer uh, who is currently studying in Max Planck Institute in Germany. Um, so first of all, uh, I want to give a brief introduction of what cryptography is actually. Uh, so cryptography is a branch of cryptology and cryptology has two main branches, which are cryptography and cryptanalysis. Um, cryptography is the science of secret writing and cryptanalysis is science and art at the same time, according to the book. Uh, the book says that cryptanalysis is the science and art of breaking crypto systems. Uh, I know it sounds a bit evil, but even though cryptanalysis sounds evil, it's the only way to assure if a crypto system is secure enough. Um, so, Cryptography has three side branches, which are symmetric ciphers, asymmetric ciphers, and protocols. Uh, we haven't studied protocols be because um, we thought it has nothing to do with a mathematical approach. Because of that, uh, I will be talking about symmetric ciphers and asymmetric ciphers. So let's talk them. Uh, let's talk about them. Uh, symmetric ciphers are used in data encryption and integrity check of messages. In symmetric ciphers, users uh, share a secret key. As you can understand, it is a key that only the sender and the receiver uh, know about. And for the asymmetric ciphers, they are used for digital signatures and key establishments. And they, in, in asymmetric ciphers, users have a public key in addition to a secret key. Uh, even though they have different basics, usually asymmetric algorithms and symmetric algorithms used together. Uh, I will explain them in the following slides. I will show a example of it. Let me continue. Uh, so before I uh, continue, I want to give you this terminology. Um, so there are not much of it. Uh, we just have four different words here. Uh, so. Plain text is the message we want to be encrypted and delivered. Cipher text is the text has been encrypted and we wish to be uh, decrypted by our receiver. Uh, key is the string we use for transforming plain text to cipher text and vice versa. And key space is the set of all possible keys. Um, to sum up what basically cryptography does, uh, I think this picture summarizes it very well. Uh, so we have Alice and Bob, um, they are the good guys, they just want to communicate, and Oscar is the bad guy, uh, and he wants to steal our uh, message. So here X is the plain text, Y is the cipher text, and key is uh, the key that K letter represents the key that we use for encrypting the message. And so before uh, talking about uh, ciphers, I want to mention a very important principle, a principle that comes with the computer age, actually. So it's very important because uh, people usually think that if they made a system very complicated or uh, very complex or very random, that no one could break it, but it's not the fact. Uh, so let me just read it and summarize it. Uh, so a crypto system should be secure even if the attacker knows all details about the system with the exception of the secret key. In particular, the system should be secure when the attacker knows the encryption and decryption algorithms. So uh, like I said, people think that if they made random crypto systems or uh, they made very difficult or very complex crypto systems, then they would be uh, secure enough uh, and they couldn't be they, they could be unbreakable, but it's not the fact that beca because uh, it, this principle says it actually um, has nothing to do with them, but uh, the reliability of your crypto system uh, depends only, of the, only on the size of your key space. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about cryptanalysis. Uh, cryptanalysis has also three side branches, which are classical cryptanalysis, implementation attacks, and social engineering. Uh, I'm not going to talk about social engineering. Um, so here, uh, I want to actually talk about um, brute force attacks and implementation attacks, and also letter frequency analysis, uh, which are a branch of mathematical analysis. Uh, so for brute force attacks, uh, one always try to find tries to find the correct key. Uh, the attacker just keeps on trying until uh, she finds the correct key for um, breaking the system. And but uh, the attacker must be careful because sometimes incorrect keys can give us false positive results. Therefore, uh, if you are an attacker, uh, brute force attack is not the most uh, precise way to break a crypto system. Uh, so for letter frequency analysis, uh, it is a branch of mathematical analysis because it makes use of statistics. Uh, by letter frequency analysis, it could be easy to detect letters in the text. Therefore, good ciphers uh, should hide the statistical properties of the encrypted plain text because if the attacker uh, finds the letter, letter frequencies in the English alphabet, then it would be uh, very easy for her to break the uh, system. It it just uh, help. It would just help her. And for implementation attacks, actually, it uh, focuses on side channel attacks rather than finding a mathematical flaw. And if you ask me what side channel attack is, uh, I can't give you an answer because we we didn't study it because it's not a a very mathematical approach. It's not a work of a mathematician but an engineer. Therefore, we didn't study it. Uh, let me continue. So um, there are three types of classical ciphers here. You can see there are three of the main uh, classical ciphers and they are substitution cipher, shift cipher and affine cipher. Uh, since substitution and shift cipher are very easy and a bit boring, I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, we studied affine cipher and I will talk about a fine cipher uh, in this slide. Uh, just let me explain the algorithm a bit. So we are picking four different elements from uh, Z26, X, Y, A, and B. Uh, for encryption parts, uh, so here X is our plain text and we are multiplying X with A and adding B to it in modulus 26. And we are getting Y, which is our cipher text. And for decryption part, we are doing it um, Um, so for encryption part, we are taking X, which is our plain text, uh, and we are multiplying it with A and adding B to it in modulus 26, and this is our encryption process. And for decryption, uh, we are subtracting B from Y, which is our uh, ciphertext, and multiplying it with uh, inverse of A and getting our plain text back in modulus 26. Uh, so as you can guess, uh, here A and B are the keys. And we have one restriction, uh, which is the greatest common divisor of A and 26 must be equal to one in order to find the inverse of the element A here. Uh, so you may ask, why are we working on Z26? It's just because of the English alphabet. English alphabet has 26 letters and therefore we're working with uh, Z26. Uh, we can just arrange it uh, to the, maybe we can modify it uh, with the alphabet, with different alphabets. Um, so actually, we didn't have to do the programming part, but uh, when my mentor found out that I have basic knowledge of Python, we decided to give it a try, uh, if we could write it, and we made it, and so let me just explain a bit. Uh, we defined, uh, at the very beginning, we defined five different functions. Uh, inverse mode function, as you can guess, gives us the inverse of an element in the modulus. Uh, chart to num function uh, gives us, uh, like, turns our characters to numbers because at the very beginning of the algorithm, we are writing a text, but uh, we are working uh, mathematically on it. We are doing some mathematical work, uh, and therefore we have to change characters to numbers. Um, and therefore we wrote a chart to num function, uh, and we use um, or 
or uh, function and we we subtract we are subtracting 97 which is the unicode number of uh, lowercase letter a here and a num to char function is just as the same and but um, it turns numbers to characters and encryption and decryption functions are just same as the uh, same as the algorithms I have um, shown in the previous slide. Uh, so let me continue. So we begin our code with a uh, choice. We ask the user if uh, she wants to encrypt or decrypt. After that, we wrote an if else statement. So on the right hand side, you can see our results. Um, we ask an user wants encryption because um, she entered one and she entered the plain text Ali Veli, but and we used uh, first and second keys here d and l which are basically the same as a and b on the previous slides and our encrypted text is this text that you can see from uh, on the right corner uh, so this is the encryption part so for decryption uh, we've entered zero and we have entered the Cipher text, which is the same as uh, the text you saw on the previous slide, and we entered the keys D and L, same keys, and we get the plain text that we have entered at the very beginning. So our algorithm just worked very well. Um, so now I want to uh, talk about some basic number theory knowledge for cryptography because. Uh, in the following slides, I will talk about RSA, and for uh, studying RSA, one needs to know some basic number theory. Um, so there are Euclidean algorithm, Euler's phi function, and Euler's theorem. Uh, since we all know Euclidean algorithm from our discrete math classes, uh, I'm not going to talk about it, but I will just remind you what Euler's phi function and Euler's theorem uh, are. So Euler's phi function says that the number of integers in Zm relatively prime to m is denoted by phi of m. And Euler's theorem says that a and b be integers with greatest common divisor equal to one, then a to the phi of m must be equal to one in modulus m. Um, so let's uh, begin with RSA. What actually is RSA? Actually, RSA is an acronym that comes from the surnames uh, Rice, Shamir, and Edelman. Uh, who are the three scientists, actually three cryptographers that you can see in that picture. And RSA is most widely used uh, asymmetric cryptographic uh, scheme in the world right now. And it is used for key transport and digital signatures. And it is used often with a symmetric cipher such as uh, AES, that, which is a crypto system I'm not going to talk about today. Um, now, for RSA, we need some requirements, and there are actually four of them. Uh, so first of, uh, first of all, the infusibility of determining the private key D uh, given the public key values E and N, because um, attacker has the public key, and you must determine the private key very well in order to prevent the attacks on your crypto system. Uh, the second is, one RSA encryption uh, can only encrypt L bits, where L is the bit length of N. And here, the typical L would be 124 bits. So you can imagine uh, how big numbers we are working with. And the third one is that need of a method for very long numbers, actually very long primes. Uh, I'm emphasizing primes because it's important to work with long primes in RSA, and I will explain it more detail in the next slides. And last but not least, for a given n, there must be many private key and public key pairs because um, attacker may plan a brute force attack, and since um, he already knows the uh, public key, we must create as many as possible uh, public and private key pairs. Um, so, like, aside from a fine cipher, RSA needs a preparation part, and here it is key generation. Uh, so, for key generation, we have five different steps. Uh, in the first step, we are choosing two large primes, P and Q. Uh, this may seem the most. Um, this may seem that not that difficult to understand, or it may seem very simple, but actually, I think it is the most important part here. 
Uh, we are computing n by multiplying these two, and we are computing Euler's function. And in the fourth step, uh, there is a typo actually. We are choosing public exponents, but we cannot choose one. And this is the typo. I will explain it on the following slide. Um, and the public exponents e and the phi of n, uh, between these two, uh, there is a correlation. Uh, the greatest common divisor of these two must be equal to one. And at the end, uh, we are computing private key D. Uh, there, there, are this, there is the second typo. Uh, D times E must be equal to one in modulus phi of N. Um, so for the encryption part, it's, it's so easy. Um, so we're just taking the plain text X and X to the E must be equal to uh, Y in modulus N. And it may seem uh, really, really easy, but uh, since we will be working with very large primes, it won't be that easy. And decryption part is just the same, but this time we are using private key D and we are just writing Y to the D where Y is the cipher text and we will get X, uh, our plain text back. So um, to demonstrate RSA in one picture, um, the attackers is nothing. Attacker just um, knows the public key, and the communication is just like so in RSA. It's it's not that complicated actually. Lara, um, you have three minutes. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned um, in the in the step one of key generation, we have to find large primes, and to find large primes, we actually have two different tests, which are Fermat's primality test and Miller-Rabin test. Uh, Miller-Rabin test is actually the generalization of Fermat's primality test, and I'm going to talk about Miller-Rabin because in RSA we are using Miller-Rabin. Uh, so what does Miller-Rabin do? Actually, as an input, we are um, entering a prime candidate P tilde with these. Um, restriction as you see and security parameter s uh, what is a security parameter uh, if my security parameter s is equal to five then it means that i want miller rabin to be run five times and as an output of this primality test it says that ptl is composite or ptl is likely prime uh, so miller rabin is not a definite algorithm it's a probabilistic algorithm because it says that it's likely prime so even if our security parameter is really high uh, it is still not that reliable it's not that precise because it's a probabilistic algorithm uh, so i'm skipping the algorithm because um we already written one um so we have wrote, we have written these um, Miller-Rabin algorithm and we defined a two attic function because in the previous slide, uh, P tilde must be equal to two to the U times R and U was the two attic uh, evaluation of P tilde and we just referred to that U here. And so this is our function. We have defined some function as primeness. You are just entering your uh, candidate P. You are entering the U, which is the power of two uh, in the algorithm, and you are entering your security parameter. And as an output, you see here, um, it just gives us if it's a likely prime or if it's definitely a composite. So it was the end of my slide, uh, but I want to add something. Um, we also wrote uh, RSA for uh, 32 bits, but it was really uh, difficult to explain it on the code, and it would it will be, I mean, it would be very difficult for you to understand from the text. Therefore, we decided not to put it on the presentation. Uh, we also studied Diffie-Hellman key exchange and elliptic curves, but since uh, they are also very difficult topics to understand and I, I, we thought that I won't have time, uh, and, but, and we are right, I think. Um, so that was all from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you all, Arya. Thank you.